which one is it? Lee. Uh, Lee. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's make a start. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, so we have a uh, well, welcome and uh, congratulations on getting this far through the day. We have um, five papers in this panel, so we're going to be moving at quite a quite a uh, a pace. Um, so I'll keep this brief. My name is David Lung. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here uh, at SOAS in the Department of the Languages and Cultures of South Asia, and it's my very great pleasure to be here and chairing this panel today. Um, as I say, we have uh, five panelists. So I'll introduce them. Uh, as and when they come. I will remind you all of the uh, no photography or video or recording policy without the explicit consent of panellists and organisers. If you don't have that in advance, please do respect that. And remember that it's because you know, a lot of our participants are coming from countries where that is an issue, where being outed and identified as, a, as associated with these things can be difficult. Um, I will, what else did I have to say? Uh, I don't think anything else particularly, but hopefully we'll get through this quite quickly everyone on time, and then we'll have time for a good discussion at the end. Um, so, uh, our first speaker is uh, Lee Kyung Rim, um, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Korean Language and Literature at Seoul National University, and she'll be speaking on Disguised Queerness, a Portrait of Colonized Korean Young Man. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thanks to the committee, the convener, and fellow speakers, and the audience that organizing this conference and giving me an opportunity to share my idea with you. My major is Korean modern literature, especially early 20th century fictions. So my argument focuses on specific Korean contexts and theoretical methods like representation in literature, modernity, post-colonialism, or decolonism. Uh, I guess the texts I analyze here are not at all familiar to you, so you probably never heard of anything about whom I present about. Uh, but I believe that by giving you a sketch on the representation of queerness, in this case homosexuality specifically, in certain colonial contexts, I hope to share some insights about how queerness worked under those contexts. And as you see, English is not my first language, so uh, if I say something old or sound old, please look past it. Uh, my presentation is about Lee kwang the man in the photo, and his representation of homosexuality. He is one of the most problematic figures in the history of Korean literature. He was a monumental writer, a passionate independence activist, and also a national traitor. During Japanese colonial period from 1910 to 1945, he gained a great reputation as a best-selling writer and influential intellectual. But in 1940s, he committed strong pro-Japanese acts. For that, he was officially sentenced as guilty of national treason. Uh, the title of this article, Pioneer of Modern Literature or Pro-Japanese Hypocrite, summarizes his complex position and homosexuality only adds more complexity. Homosexual motives in his works has been treated like something should be ignored or underestimated in most part, because they seem to damage his reputation as a symbolic national writer. But to me, questioning about the nature of his sexuality seems to be a secondary matter. After all, we, uh, his time was before the discourse on homosexuality and our interrogation cannot reach to him. Regarding homosexuality being a key feature in his early works, I believe the meaningful question for now is to ask what the representation of homosexuality enabled him to do. Uh, in the paper, I try to review the context of it and understand why his first work must have been written in empire's language and why homosexuality was denied and disguised later. Uh, Michel Foucault suggested that homosexuality is a constructed knowledge grew out of a particular context in the 1870s in Europe. In this context, homosexuality is defined as an abnormality. European sexology was brought into Japan in early 1910s and into Korea about a decade later. Lee kwang wrote his first work just before the introduction of it. Uh, meanwhile, in Joseon Dynasty's culture, which is a strongly Confucianism, a pretty modern uh, form of uh, Korea, uh, non-heterosexuality was put outside of this course. 
uh, because it was uh, irrelevant to the reproduction of a clan, which was a crucial task in Joseon society. So on this ground, homosexuality existed as a sexual possibility, though it was considered as something that cannot be recognized openly. Uh, but the representation of homosexuality in his first work, Is It Love, did not stand on this ground. Is It Love is a story about our love between boys. Uh, back then, he was a 17-year-old boy studying in Tokyo. What this text focuses on is the feeling of love, not the homosexual love. Uh, is It Love shapes Moongil, uh, the main character, as a subject uh, experiencing intense emotions such as uh, expectation, frustration, anger, despair, and everything. Love appears as a summation of these various emotions. Mungil's sense of self comes from its emotions inward, from questioning oneself about them. Uh, the title of this story, Is in Love, codifies this very process of shaping oneself as a possessor of internality. To Igangsu, being modern subject means to be a self-regulating subject uh, possess of its own peculiarity. Uh, he thought that the foundation of it is emotion. He defined the literature as a writing, including emotional factors, and regarded emotion as an essence of modern art. Uh, the problem is that it does not exist in his homeland. The absence of love and art meant that uh, to be a modern subject, you should go to the empire. In this string of thoughts, you can easily notice the internalized colonialism. To a boy from a colony, the modern was sensed through three figures. A student as a new social stratum, love as a new emotion, and literature as a new art. Uh, he depicted himself as an ensemble of all of three in his diary, which was published 16 years later. Uh, but, uh, but you can also see the nationalistic sense of identity in this diary too, uh, like hatred toward the Japanese, uh, from his point of view, Japanese empire was a very ambivalent existence. It is a place where he imitates the colonizer but cannot transform into one, as Homi Baba suggested. The reason he accepted love, including homosexuality, can be rather simple. Homosexuality in empire appeared as a love between students, as the most modern kind of uh, relationship. He accepted it from the specific Meiji student culture. In this model, uh, one of the most distinctive features is the image of idealized beautiful boy. But what intrigues more is that in contrast to the representation of male homosexuality was a physical one, homosexual relationship between female students was recognized as a spiritual <coughs> one. Pure relationship between girls approached, uh, appeared much closer to love as a new modern emotion. Sexual body is hidden in easy love in contrast to intense emotion that cannot be distinguished easily from extreme friendship. The idea of beautiful boy from male student homosexuality culture and emotional stresses from female one conjoin in this story. As a part of uh, imperial student culture, uh, homosexuality ins inscribes otherness on the colonized, making it a hybrid subject. The dilemma started from right there. It means that the colonized uh, needed to depend on the empire to be modernized. The reason is it love set the stage in Japan, the object of love as the imperial, as being written in empire's language, needs to be put under those contexts. Uh, the fact that desire, which was described in his diary, obviously, is concealed in easy love raises another problem. Uh, in his diary, he tried to bleach its homosexual nuance by combining it uh, with a love for a girl and put love and desire both in the category of heterosexuality. However, in this diary, even in heterosexual context, sexual desire is described as a devilish one. The inseparable duality of love, physicality, and spirituality raises a dilemma to him. Is it love evaded this dilemma by putting a boy in front, hiding a sexual subject, but this strategy quickly fails? One of the causes is that love for the nation became a major theme, as a great love is identified with a love for the nation, transcending individual relationships, sexual body, which is individual in its nature, is needed to be expelled. 
The problem is that to him, desexualizing heterosexuality and female homosexuality was possible, uh, while male homosexuality was not. After 10 years of easy love, this became a main theme of Yun Gwang-woo. This story is an extended version of easy love with the addition of minor character subplot and alteration of main character's age. He changed a boy into a young man and exposed a sexual body in front. The way this text treats homosexuality is partly, partially related to the gendered experience of it in Korea at the time. Female homosexuality was understood as a spiritual one, as a transitional one to normal heterosexuality, while male homosexuality, which was identified with uh, abnormal physical desire, was defined as a pathological flaw that should be removed or subdued. A more problematic feature is that the colonial nuance in the representation of homosexual body. In Junon, the minor character subplot, the fa failure of the imperial homosexuality model based on the age difference between a boy and a youth becomes clear. The reason is that the boy, Junon, is satisfied with emotional intimacy, while the Japanese young man pursues physical desire beyond it. What Yi Gwang did in Yun Gwang was to deny the homosexuality shaped under the empire's context by concluding that it cannot be desexualized. From this point of view, Yun Gwang can be understood as uh, his own way of decolonizing self. The ambivalent uh, modern representation of homosexuality itself can be examined in case of him. Representing homosexuality was a self a modernizing self mechanism, but representation of homosexuality itself was modernized as a pathological one. Even Yi Gangsu kept justifying homosexuality by insisting that why we cannot just love a beautiful person, a man or woman. But at this stage, uh, homosexuality is received as a spiritual love which can be extended to the nation easily. Though so desire, which interrupts uh, the extension, cannot be easily expelled from male homosexuality that he accepted. To conclude, homosexuality uh, straddling colony and empire made him torn between desire and mind. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kyungri. Um, and it uh, was certainly uh, within time, which is always nice. Um, we uh, may, in fact, not have five papers in this session unless Sucheta happens to be hiding under the bleachers somewhere. But um, no, I don't think she's shown up. So uh, we can maybe relax a bit more, and there'll be more time for uh, discussion. Um, and thank you for sorting that out. Um, and so our second paper, then, is uh, Yung Chao Kao. Um, speaking on, who is a, sorry, I should say, PhD candidate at the Department of Sociology in Rutgers University. And he'll be speaking to us about transnational, transnational circulations of moral conservatism, how the US and how the US and Taiwanese Christian pro family movements conspire to produce sexual inequalities with decolonial discourses. In Chan. Thank you very much. Um, so, actually, in this conference, many people are querying their own sexualities or the history or um, the construction of sexualities. But I'm taking a very uh, oppositional uh, position to queer the, con uh, the constructive and of the conservative side. Um, just, I just, because this is my first presentation in the, the SOAS you know, queer Asian, I just want to contextualize my own positionality uh, with my research and also the queer communities. Um, I have been uh, outing and openly gay in Taiwan for uh, 16 years. Um, now I identify myself as the activist scholar. Now I've been trained as the sociologist um, from my college life to the postgraduate um, period. So actually my own project here, you are going to hear is about like totally openly gay, you know, my extended family and of my, the society has been know who I am. But now I'm trying to step into a very uh, precarious and riskable uh, journey, step into the conservative church, especially Christian communities, to understand why they organized a huge campaign opposing the 
legislation of same-sex marriage and Tongzhi education. Uh, Tongzhi means uh, LGBTQI um, education in Taiwan. Then I'm going to explain you um, more uh, in my own presentation. So actually, you, know, you are going to hear how uh, openly gay step into that kind of conservative community, but also take some risks to show you the knowledge that I'm going to present here. Um, Recently, no, we know a notion about the Taiwan exceptionalism. Now, in the Western media, including BBC and the Washington Post, and also the New York Times, no, many newspapers try to frame Taiwan as the exception in East Asia or in the total Asia. Now, um, the New York Times say Taiwan is the beacon for Asian gays, uh, or BBC said Taiwan is said to be the first Asian to legalize census marriage. You may understand you know, why I put that as the blank because you know, it depends on the relationship between Taiwan and China and also how the, new, new, uh, the newspapers are going to take the stand. And so you can flick the blank with like the society, country, or just a place. Um, but based on the scholarly work, you can also hear much before the legalization of sex and marriage, Taiwan, um, the Taiwanese gender, uh, Sorry, Taiwanese gender equity education has been framed as a noble uh, exception you know, compared with the Title IX in the US as well. But actually, in my own research, I want to critique the discourses of this kind of Taiwan exceptionalism um, by using the decolonizing um, strategy. I'm going to show you three points here. The first one is you know, uh, many newspapers, especially based on the, in the Western, um, try to use the gay marriage or census marriage, but they ignore the subjectivity of the Tongzhi that is hardly translatable you know, into the gay politics you know, as the language used in the Western community. And the Tongzhi is not just another synonym of the LGBT or uh, you, you know, the endless acronym list. LGBT, QQ, IAA, blah, 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 or BDSM is not included here as well. Then, but also, Tongzhi is another like the term borrowed from the communist politics that has been uh, transformed into um, a referral of the comrades of sex politics. So I think that Tongzhi as a local term provides much more flexibility, ambiguity for the room of the Tongzhi subjects to step in and to embed their own subjectivity into that kind of invisible but also visible umbrella term. The second, uh, many newspapers use the legalization of census marriage. But however, I think that's the colonial understanding of what's going on here in Taiwan using their own uh, Christian-centric understanding of uh, same-sex marriage because homosexuality was never or barely criminalized or illegalized in the Taiwanese history because Taiwan was never uh, conquered or colonized by any Christian uh, domination. Uh, you know, there's a joke in Taiwan saying that, well, hopefully we can be colonized by the Britain because that's the way that we can automatically learn how English can be spoken. <laughs> However, you know, based on this kind of history, Taiwan does have many religious systems that they appreciate or affirmatively recognize homosexual, um, homosexuality or homoeroticism. For example, you have a transgender uh, Buddhist deity called Guan Yin. You know, he or she can be male and female or uh, you know, gender neutral. Or Mazu, a goddess belief, then that's a totally against you, the patriarchal belief in the Christianity. Another way is you know, that kind of Western imagination about the Taiwanese um, program is the Euro American centric and progressive lineal temporality ignores the Taiwan's um, the long term history borrowed from the Taiwanese, uh, the Chinese, and the Japanese history that form the homoeroticism. And that kind of a form of, of affirmation has been erased and ignored under the uh, expansion of Western modernity and the colonization. Um, I will quickly show you the history. Actually, you know, the, West, uh, the Western media's por uh, portray about the Taiwanese exception uh, totally ignore or underestimate the backlash of the legalization of sense of marriage and the uh, implementation of Tongzhi education. Like as early as you know, two decades ago, there's a true love alliance um, calling against the, the 
uh, implementation of Tongzi education. And now Taiwan has the first Christian-based party in Taiwan, which wins the vote of 1.69%. For those who understand the homosexual subculture in Taiwan, you may understand what are the sexual meaning of 169, like eating liuzhou, which means the anal and uh, the oral sex. <laughs> but you know, God makes it so um, uh, amazing. So, but actually, no, I'm trying to think about more deeply about the Taiwan exceptionalism. Now, if you learn from the Adam Zick, um, who is the well-established sociologist that like, highly frequently uh, cited, his, uh, sorry, her model showed that there are the three major macro level of the factors that can positively increase people's attitude to homosexuality and also increase the likelihood for a country to pass the same-sex marriage, which are the stable democracy, a stronger economic development, and also lack of Christian domination in a country. And Taiwan fulfills all the three characteristics but Taiwan was not legalized since its marriage yet. So actually, I think the other theoretical side of Taiwan uh, exceptionalism is Taiwan should have legalized since its marriage, but why it isn't? So actually, we should flip the question and to think about what are the social forces that stop Taiwan to be um, the country that has been recognized since its marriage. But we should not only look for you know, what are the social factors that make Taiwan uh, so. Uh, based on the literature review, you know, we can find some like the, the politics or the economic explanation, also the globalized uh, cultural war, which I, I have no time to explain more deeply, but I will be very glad to answer your question in the Q&A section. But I want to show you another deeper understanding about how the conservative of Christianity has been embedded within the transnational and global religious network that can provide the partial explanation why Taiwan has been procrastinated and uh, stalled in terms of the legalization of census marriage. The study here um, is based on my 18 months ethnography in Taiwan and also uh, 62 interviews with the religious leaders, NGO goer, uh, uh, church goers, NGO organizations, and also some professionals in the relevant area. And I also study the qualitative and quantitative content analysis uh, based on the 200 uh, Christian books that I collected in my own field work. I'm going to give you a quick vignette about a small story. This is the letter that I observed in the 2011, a letter saying that it's a letter to the school officials uh, traveled from the United States and translated to, uh, to Taiwan. And the letter said, like um, many homosexuals, especially the homosexual youth, can be easily treated after they step into their own adulthood. And there's no scientific evidence that an individual is born gay or transgender. Um, or you know, homosexuality can be uh, treated and there's no risk about that. And of course, we can find many uh, problems about this letter. But I'm very curious you know, at the beginning, you know, is the, transnational, uh, the translation correct? Or where does the so-called scientific knowledge come from? So I use the very uh, basic literature review techniques to find there are many problems within the transnational genealogy of this letter. First, actually, you know, the North is uh, uh, notorious religion-based religion um, in the U.S. has been pr produced the uh, uh, knowledge about against homosexuality, but also all of the um, researchers cited here public uh, clarify their own research that they are not against homosexuality, and there's no um, intention that they want to cure homosexuals, as the letter said. But however, after the clarification has been made publicly in the newspapers, um, the the letter rather uh, the. Uh, the president of Tom Benton, which is the president of uh, American College of Pediatricians, refused to appeal or correct his own letter because he said, quote, um, although those researchers don't support my stance, but their own research does. So that kind of academic scandals can be found that it has the transnational journey. That is the uh, a false fact about homosexuality and you know, the sexualities in general produced in American Florida. 
And um, after three months translated and traveled to Taiwan, um, well, and sadly, in the same months, the false facts about homosexuality was uh, replicated back to uh, Hong Kong. And after another um, half a year, those story occurred in the Protestant area, but after half a year, it went back to Taiwan, but stepped into the, the Catholic uh, regime. Then the same wrong uh, message has been uh, traveled back to the American continent. So that's the, just a vignette or just a tip about the iceberg of the transnational uh, Christian conservative network. And I want to provide you, or I only have three minutes left, but I want to provide you like the, uh, the modeling that I've stepped here in my 50-page uh, um, paper. Um, I think <laughs> <laughs> there are four kinds of uh, models that we can learn. Direct import, you know, those what I call the D-West, the, you no, know, many economic, uh, sorry, electronic waste has been produced in the Euro America and was unprocessed, you know, and, and shipped to the, the global south that creates a lot of pollution and the health disparities there. But I borrow that E West to create another new term called the D West, the discursive waste, to, to figure those, uh, the fake facts about uh, 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 anti homosexuality. But those D West, you know, have four kinds of transnational circuits that may influence the Taiwanese uh, Christian conservatives that study, but also may diffuse around other um, Asian country. You know, from the perspective of Taiwanese Christian conservatives' perspective, um, the world map is not geographically proportionally portrayed in the way it should be, because they only maximified those countries that can borrow from the conservative ideologies and the objects. For example, France provides the symbolic system. As you can see, this, is, this part is the Taiwanese the campaign, and this part is the, the France. Now, you, they use a very similar binary color system, and they only you know, portray and worship the ideal type of family, of course, monogamous, heterosexual family. And it should be one man, one woman and one boy, one daughter. Not two boys, not two daughters, but you know, four persons there. Maybe one dog in American context. <laughs> and they also use the mass uh, mobilization repertoire you know, in front of the national monuments. And the second, you know, they use the German, German uh, ideology because the, based on the German uh, constitution, the definition of marriage should be a monogamous and heterosexual. And that is the way how the Taiwanese Christian conservatives support their own argument that separate but equal is exceptional. So actually, no, they maximize the, uh, the German model but shrink the, the, um, the France and also the UK model. They totally ignored the UK in their own world map. And the US is another complex story because at the same time as I saw, show you the D West travel, you know, some institutions uh, constitutionally and con uh, continuously create the anti homosexuality discourses has been highly cited by those Amer uh, Taiwanese conservatives. But also, it is not just about discourse, it's about the whole ecosystem. Um, Taiwan uh, duplicated the ecosystem of conservatives from the US. They first you know, used the churches to collect the doné, donations you know, about the money that they used to, uh, for the anti-gay. But at the same time, they used those money to establish the research foundation um, that support some researchers to produce the anti uh, discourses, but at the same time, you can find those discourses of the, uh, the journal articles cannot find the well-established flagship academic journal to be published. So they create their own journal, journals as well. And those knowledge, um, so be cited by the church, and they think uh, that's the way to establish their own campaign. Um, sorry, my time's up, but no, just let you know, I think you know, the transnational circulation of the sexual uh, knowledge is one of the ways to understand the conservatives in the, in the Asia. But Taiwan, although be considered as the exception, but it can be critic critiqued and criticized uh, as another way to produce the anti tongzi ideology that we could be more critical, critical and radical against. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Ying Chow. That was uh, another very stimulating paper. Um, we shall move on to... So our third, uh, third of four papers um, will be Tamara Megal, um, who is not speaking with her co-author of the paper who couldn't make it, um, Dan Vijaya. Um, and Tamara has her MA from, uh, develop, uh, in Development Studies from the Institute of Social Studies at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and will be speaking to us on challenging coloniality in psychological academia and the pathologizing of the LGBT community. Tamara. Thank you, David, for that introduction, and also thank you to the organizing committee of Queer Asia. It's a pleasure to speak here today. Um, I think I'll be following on some of those themes uh, in the last presentation about knowledge flows, so um, that was really stimulating. Uh, so to introduce myself, I'm based in Indonesia for the last five years. I'm originally from Australia, did my master's in Netherlands, um, so a bit of a mixed identity. Um, and I wrote this paper in collaboration with my friend Firadan, who is Indonesian nationality. We both focus on gender and queer studies. Uh, There's a picture of him here, so you can feel he's also in the room. <laughs> and he's wearing traditional Javanese cl clothes there. Uh, so in Indonesia, uh, there's systematic marginalization of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community. Uh, so I'm using this term LGBT. Um, queer is not really commonly referred to in Indonesia. Um, and it was touched on in, in this morning's um, presentation as well, a bit by Ben. Um, so since 2016, there's a dramatic increase in negative public comments, including the Minister for Education. Um, he said that the LGBT community should be barred from academic institutions and should not be given room to conduct their activities, and that LGBT people corrupt the morals of the Indonesian nation while a university is a moral safe, safeguard. Um, there was also comments by the Indonesian Psychiatric Association uh, that categorized transgender people as mentally disordered and that homosexuals and bisexuals were in danger of developing a psychiatric disorder unless they adapt to uh, norms, being heterosexual norms. Uh, also on television talk show, Indonesia Lawyers Club, a psychiatrist, Dr. Fidiansha, showed the Indonesian psychology handbook as an argument that homosexuality, bisexuality, and transgenderism are mental illnesses. And he is a promoter of correction therapy. And so this is occurring in the context of possible criminalization. And uh, the bill has already gone through judicial review and is in parliament with some fragments still being discussed. But it doesn't look hopeful. Um, and this will also affect um, heterosexual couples, couples who are not married. So in 2017, there's a growing violence also. In April, um, police in Surabaya conducted a raid on a hotel room, arresting 14 men and forcing them to undergo HIV tests because it was allegedly a gay sex party. Um, and more than 140 men were arrested in a gay spa in North Jakarta, uh, I think it was last month in, in May, under a new ambiguous anti-pornography law. Uh, so this discriminatory labelling of LGBT as a sickness by people who work as professional psychiatrists and psychologists is very damaging. Their opinion is regarded highly because they are considered as experts on sexuality and cognitive behaviour. And they're also in a position where they, they are giving counselling, and that cannot be done safely with professionals who regard uh, pe people outside of sexual norms as mentally disordered. So we wanted to look at in our research um, about how homophobic discourses are being produced and reproduced by psychology academics, and how does psychological academia in Indonesia perceive the LGBTIQ community in Indonesia? Uh, another aspect of this is that in Indonesia, historical communities used to celebrate a diversity of sexualities. And we want to look at how this change um, came about. So we explore those questions. 
and look at how heteronormative discourses on sexuality have their origins in Western forms of knowledge. So the hegemonic knowledge systems endeavour to assure that heterosexual orientation always fits in societies. Thus, homosexual courtship and mating or other sexual orientations are often not embraced in the same way as normal, natural and biologically fit in human relations. And we draw on reference here to Foucault, the power and legitimacy of heteronormativity as a social order is based on its claim to nature. Diverse human sexuality is neglected in many disciplines, including psychiatry. And this leads to the creation of a dualistic understanding of sexual difference of bodies and sexual orientation. And Foucault Sterling argues that scientists create truths about sexuality through their daily lives, through experiments and medical practices. Thus, expert knowledge on sexuality contributes to shaping sexuality's forms and its social organization. Before the colonization era, Indonesian's history has demonstrated the various gender identities and expressions in divergent ethnic groups of the archipelago. These include Bisu, Kalalai, and Kalabai from Sulawesi, and Tomboy from Sumatra. And it shifted in the Dutch colonial period when they tried to impose the gender binary by policing of gendered behavior and sexual activities. So the colonization lasted around 400 years. Long after independence, around 1970, medical and psychological terminology from the global north introduced the term of homosexuality in Indonesia. And since then, heteronormative ideology has become stronger. And so just a note on, on our methodology um, that we are not seeking to make claims at the scale of the psychology academic field in Indonesia or even at one university, but we did focus on the Faculty of Psychology at Universitas Indonesia, the national university uh, that's top ranked and oriented to research and training. And we referenced to the experiences of three people, lecturers and students, who were involved at that department. And these experiences were gathered through informal conversations with the research participants. So some of uh, the results that we had, um, I would like to go through um, with a bit of reflection. Uh, so Foucault proposes a relational view of power, that power creates its subjects through the production and reproduction of social norms and constructions of institutions or groups. The powerful create regimes of truth that frame the boundaries of the categories of debate and what is considered knowledge. Uh, and we find it here useful to look at discourse and it being constituted by the configuration of power, knowledge and control of the truth and how we can use that tool to analyse the psychology department or psychology discourse and how discourses shape the fields of action. The state and national uh, education apparatus create discourse by delimiting what is knowledge of psychology and who are the expert producers of psychology psychological knowledge, that is the psychology scientists that the university creates and the academics that become experts and go and participate in media debates and inform politicians. Firstly, at UI, Universitas Indonesia, European and US theories of psychology form the main basis of the course. And uh, the course of gender and sexuality are not um, discussed are not taught as individual courses, but it's infused throughout um, particularly uh, mental disorders and sexual disorder courses. Uh, for one of our subjects, she believed that psychological academics should do more to seek out the root of local knowledge in regards to psychology, a kind of Indonesian psychology. In Chambers' work on power, uh, he argues that professionals are in the position of agents who know better Psychologists produce knowledge about mental health, illness and behaviour and disseminate this knowledge to other members of society. So we're looking at the hierarchies of knowledge here. And um, I also wanted to briefly mention the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder, the DSM. 
So many Indonesian psychologists in the 1970s obtained their higher education in the US. So they adopted this book, uh, which was published by the American Psychiatric Association. And uh, this was then connected with the International Classification of Disease and Related Health Problems, which was available to World Health Organization member states such as Indonesia. With some modifications, these manuals were translated into Indonesian language by the Indonesian Psychiatry Association. And this history shows us that the classification of diagnoses flows from the global north to Indonesia. The DSM-3 has since been updated two times. However, bringing back their knowledge to Indonesia does not mean that academics followed the DSM. And we highlight the case of the current categorization of non-heterosexual and non-normative identities as an illness in Indonesia, which neglects the current version of the DSM. Uh, so in DSM-5, gender dysphoria is now separated from sexual dysfunctions and paraphilic disorders. It's only a classification so that the client can access counselling or assistance with gender reassignment surgery. But uh, psychiatrists such as Dr. Fidiancia, as I mentioned, um, have not fully adopted the changes in the DSM-5. They, in fact, say that queer people were involved in the West with those upgrades uh, in the psychology handbook, and therefore it's not valid knowledge. It was, it was influenced by the LGBT lobby, and it's not scientific. Um, one of our uh, participants said that it conflicts with their prior opinions about sexual desires, uh, that is, that um, it's not a mental disorder, and they prefer not to change their methods of practice. So senior psychologists at Universitas Indonesia are still promoting conversion or correction therapy. Um, I'll skip here um, to talk about political homophobia. So I use this term here from Bolstroff. Um, that makes a case um, that political homophobia occurs when gay men stake a claim to civil society. In the new Indonesia, male-male desire can increasingly be, be construed as a threat to normative masculinity and thus be a threat to the nation itself. And uh, we can also turn to scholars of Indonesian femininities to see how female-female desire and bisexuality can challenge the normative roles of, what, of women as wife and mother and the nuclear family, which is a building block of the Indonesian nation. This creates a state which is heterosex, heterosexist and also an uh, environment in which political homophobia takes form. And I argue that colonization by Islamic political forces is promoting dualistic ideas of the male and female body, image, and moral behavior. Religion cannot be conceived as a causal factor, particularly as many Muslims tolerate sexual and gender minorities, and many Indonesian, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender continue to be uh, Islamic and take their faith as an important part of their identity. But the rise of politically motivated Islamic groups does contribute to a climate of repression for LGBT people. So in conclusion, uh, through the narratives of lecturers and students involved in the learning process of psychology studies, we demonstrate how knowledge rooted in colonial legacy is being produced and reproduced linked to the specific meaning of homosexuality and mental illness. And using this case of Ui, uh, we scrutinize the nexus of knowledge production, psychology and sexuality and how this discourse is transferred and interpreted across historical and geopolitical conditions. It is embedded within heterosexism that has penetrated the state and psychological institutions such as the Indonesian Psychiatrist Association and universities. New dynamics of political Islam and a masculinist vision for the Indonesian nation have contributed to political homophobia. In the field of psychology, destigmatization of non-normative sexualities needs to be addressed in order to create counseling and education spaces that are safe and supportive. While at a discursive level, queer theory could be employed to disturb normative and fixed categories of sexuality and negotiate room for more diversity in Indonesia.
Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Um, another paper and another keeping to time. I don't need to worry about these things at all. So, um, unless Sucheta has made an appearance, no? No one in the room called Sucheta or wants to give a talk, no? Um, then uh, we will move on to our fourth and final uh, presentation. Um, if I could find, there we go. So yes, finally, uh, we have an Andy Rao, um, who is a PhD student in the Department of Comparative Literature at UC, UC Irvine, um, who will be speaking to us on querying Shakespeare, querying translation, explorations from an Indian archive. And Andy. Uh, I want to thank the conference organizers and all of you for being here. I know it's been a long day already, so thank you for still being here. So I'm just going to start. This paper is not really a paper, rather it's a story, her story, my story, or more appropriately, given the great man in the title, it's a play, a play in five acts, much like his plays were. Act one, location Sahitya Academy Library, New Delhi, July 2016. This story begins with a sketch by R.S. Naidu, a sketch of Shakespeare and Kalidasa holding hands. Shakespeare in his quintessential English gentleman's attire and Kalidasa in Indian garb. Or to put it more accurately, in feminine Indian clothes. This coupling, so to speak, puts into relief the binary oppositions between East and West, India and England, colonized and colonizer, and feminine and masculine, that have haunted and continue to haunt post-colonial studies. This image is also one where a potentially queer relationship is reimagined in a heteronormative manner. It is an image that wouldn't be out of place in what Jay Kumar calls, quote, an orientalist visual economy where, and I'm continuing the quote here, the feminization of the native male body was all too common. But this sketch was not drawn by a white British colonist, right, but by an Indian. And while the implications of this are beyond the scope of this particular paper, I just wanted to state it out here. And then I use it and its metaphorical possibilities as a starting point for my explorations on translation, gender, and Shakespeare. So I want to note here that William Jones, as like several people, um, like Vasudha Dalmia, have pointed out that William Jones, the Indologist and one of the founders of the Asiatic Society, was the first to identify the GD the genius of Kalidasa with that of Shakespeare. So the Kalidasa becomes thought of as the Indian Shakespeare, right, in the European imaginary. And subsequently in the Indian imaginary too. So what do I mean by this? And here I'm drawing on Tejaswini Naranjana's work um, to refer to an Indian imaginary that has accessed the Sanskrit text why are English translations done by the early Indologists? So like a lot of people, including me, like I don't know Sanskrit, and a lot of the translations that we have access to are like within this, um, or were produced within this Orientalist framework. Um, and Niranjana, when she analyzes the role of William Jones, um, she writes that the most significant nodes of Jones's work are A, the need for translation by the European, since the natives are unreliable interpreters of their own laws and culture, B, the desire to be a lawgiver, to give Indians their own laws, and C, the desire to purify, quote, um, Indian culture and to speak on its behalf. So C is really important here for three reasons. The first is the idea that I discussed about how we access the Shakespeare Kalidasa link via Jones 
Um, and this image is probably a product of this kind of reception of Kalidasa as the Indian Shakespeare. The second is the idea of purity and how ironically, um, given the discourse in translation studies, which I'll come back to, the translation is the act that which purifies, right? So translation is purifying Indian culture. And the third, and this is a point related to purity, is the difference between how the translation of Kalidasa and other Sanskrit and Indian texts into English is imagined, and the way in which the translation of Shakespeare into Indian languages is imagined. So, and that becomes the opposite of purification. So if um, English translation of Kalidasa or of Sanskrit is a way to purify Sanskrit culture, Indian translation of Shakespeare is a way to like bastardize Shakespeare. Um, and both race and the myth of Shakespeare play a part in this. And these are some things that I return to throughout this paper. So to come back to this image, I found this image reproduced in an article by T.S. Satyanath titled, How Does Shakespeare Become Sekhpeer in Kannada? And Satyanath uses a close reading of this image as a metaphor for early Shakespeare translations and the way in which they adapted Shakespeare's plays and the manner in which they have been received. So, let's see, sorry, that's Niranjana. Anyway. This is a long quote from Satyanath. I'm not going to read the quote. I'm just going to analyze it so you can read it. So Satyanath is suggesting that at first glance, the early Shakespeare translations, much like Kalidasa in the image, seem inferior, inadequate, and unauthentic. But by using, quote, Indian iconographic tradition, or more appropriately, a Sanskrit heuristic, Satyanath is able to recuperate both the image and therefore the translations, and the discomfort they cause um, is seen as a form of empire writing back. What is not called into question, however, is the appearance of inferiority and the fact that this inferiority is clothed in what is thought of as being feminine. Also not called into question is an interrogation of why a woman, a Mem Sahab, a Dorei Sani, don't and indeed could not belong in this image. This so-called harmonious East-West encounter must have been between Shakespeare and Kalidasa. Furthermore, regardless of the quote discomfort, I mean, after all, it's like nothing stronger than discomfort, there seems to be something benign about the image, about the encounter, about the translations, perhaps because it's at the level of like culture, or because it's associated with the genius of Shakespeare. And these are some things that I return to. So act two, abstraction, or more precisely, the disciplinary boundaries of something called translation studies. Uh, Sherry Simon, who has analyzed the gendered conception and theorizing of translation in an Anglo-European context, notes that there is a heritage of double inferiority in translation theory. This double inferiority refers to the fact that both women and translators have historically been positioned as the weaker figures in their respective hierarchies. So the image of Shakespeare and Kalidasa seems to play with this notion of double inferiority. Kalidasa has often been thought of as the Indian Shakespeare, even though historically speaking, given that Kalidasa is thought to have lived in the fifth century CE, Shakespeare ought to be known as the English Kalidasa, right? But be that as it may, if we look at Satyanath's reading of the image as a metaphor for translation, Kalidasa representing a translation is seen as inferior, both because of the gender presentation and to add another dimension to Simon's formulation due to racial inferiority. That is to say, Kalidasa is not presented as an English woman, but as an Indian one. 
So here I want to call attention to a question that Christopher Larkosh brings up in his work. And he asks, how is translation as a gendered performative act inextricably configured within a constellation of other trans terms, such as transnationality, transit, transculturation, or transgender? And this is a broader question that I'm thinking about in my work. Um, but for this paper, I want to ask the question, how does translation as a, quote, gendered performative act that exists within this constellation work in the service of the creation of this like phallocentric myth of Shakespeare. And I also think here that it's worth highlighting the work of Anjali Arondekar and Geeta Patel, who in their article Queer Impossible use translation as a way to interrogate the geopolitical limitations of the imaginary of queer studies. Um, and I think using Larkosh's question in tandem with Arondekar and Patel, I think there is a way to use a critically queer perspective in order to decolonize translation as a concept um, and the ways in which it is theorized both in Asia and the West. And this is something that I would love to get feedback from on. And uh, related to this, like I just read an article in the newest issue of Words Without Borders. Um, it's by B.J. Epstein, and it's called Querying Translation, with querying with the two E's of queer. And so she highlights the relationship between translation and queerness um, rather persuasively. But then she also asked the question, quote, there are feminist or post-colonial translation strategies, so why not queer ones too, end quote. And I think this is something that goes back to the keynote panel, really, um, about thinking, like, what do we mean by queer? And there is a queer imaginary that excludes that sees the post-colonial as being different, and like, how do we not um, get into those categories, I suppose. So Act 3 is Streets of Bombay, 1920s. Um, I'm not going to go into this, but I just wanted to um, leave this image with you um, about how he sees, like an Orientalist description of um, Indian adaptations of Shakespeare on the Parsi stage. Let's see. And I think um, the one point I want to highlight about this is the fact that Shakespeare is described as benign, right? And this um, harkens back to the harmony of the East-West encounter that Satyanath alludes to. So this benignity is often ascribed to Shakespeare under the guise of something like universal genius without much interrogation. And in India and in other former British colonies, this leads to a curious double bind. Um, and there are, several, there are several people who have talked about this, um, but in his study on the impact of Shakespeare um, on Hindi literature, Jagdish Prasad Mishra talks about the fact that um, Shakespeare, quote, invaded India in the wake of the political annexation of this land uh, by the Britishers, uh, and his vogue at the outset was mainly due to the political supremacy. But, he says, his subsequent victory, so Shakespeare's subsequent victory, over the mind of India was independent of any political influence. It was entirely owing to the intrinsic merit of his works. So Prasad's statements highlight the double bind, so to speak, of the prevalence, popularity, and responses to Shakespeare in India. That he seems inextricably linked to colonial education policies and the so-called intrinsic merit of his work, um, also known in other guises as the universal appeal or the timelessness of Shakespeare. So to link this back to translation, if Shakespeare has intrinsic merit, is universal, is genius, is a genius, is authentic, is pure, that any translation will by necessity be unfaithful, a betrayal, the infidel, a woman. 
Um, these are some images that Sisson uses in his book. Um, Act four, normally when I read this paper, I turn to Virginia Woolf because um, like she was writing at the same time as Sisson and I think it's interesting to like compare them historically. Um, you can have the quote there. And I just want to say that like while attentive to gender and class, Woolf doesn't explicitly mention race or colonial subjects. But her rationale can be used to explain why Kalidasa is considered India's Shakespeare and not the other way around. What is more interesting to me is in, her, is in fact her descriptions of witches, of devils, of ostracized women. These exotic, abnormal, atypical figurations which echo in many ways Sisson's description of the Parsi theater adaptations of Shakespeare's plays. The adapters, the translators, are indeed not regarded as geniuses, even though they arguably were. Wolf's guess about Anon also speaks to the inferiority of translation as the fight for visibility, uh, for a lack of anonymity, is one that translators have and continue to struggle with. Um, Wolf's words are also important in relation to a statement I made initially about the encounter between East and West at the level of culture only being possible as, as being between Shakespeare and Kalidasa. Just as Judith Shakespeare was improbable, so to a female Kalidasa, and even if they would have existed, they wouldn't have been recognized as geniuses, just as the Parsi theater adaptations are dismissed as being unfaithful. And I think a broader point from this, again, to go back to the first panel, is the danger of going back to a pre-colonial past, um, because um, it's not that that was all, like, I don't know, glorious or whatever. Um, and then lastly, my act five is location indeterminate. Because while most of Shakespeare's plays have neat and genre-satisfying endings in their fifth act, my story doesn't. Not just because there is a lot of research yet to be done, but also because method methodologically, for me, the querying, querying practice is one that has an indeterminate ending. An indeterminate in indeterminacy that perhaps lead, lends itself to a decolonial rather than a postcolonial, um, with all its problematic associations. So to query, to queer or query Shakespeare and translation, is to unpack the myths and the metaphors um, and be left to be left in the heap of indeterminacy, opacity that lies beneath. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have, um, thank you all, four, for some excellent papers. Uh, we have some good time for, uh, for questions, especially since we lost a speaker. Um, if anyone sees Sucheta, let us know. Um, and uh, is that working too? Yeah, that's better. Um, so I encourage, invite, accept questions from the audience. Um, I will encourage you all to please, uh, well, raise your hand, I'll pick you. Uh, give us your name or affiliation very quickly, and please do keep the questions brief and to the point so we have a chance for everyone to ask them. I'll also encourage you to try and ask questions or address them to as many of the panellists as you feel uh, might have something to say on it. That saves me from having to try and do that. Um, uh, but it's not, I think there's lots of uh, interesting connections, although they're not necessarily apparent, that we can draw out between the kind of, um, you know, I mean, array of themes and, and the geographical range that you've 
uh, covered in your papers today. So please, uh, questions for the panellists. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chao Bang. I'm a writer and blogger with a certain interest in gender. I've got a question for uh, Tamara Mego, if I may. Um, forgive me if this question slightly exceeds the scope of your research, but I wanted to ask you, if I may, to what extent do you think um, what you said about the pathologization of sexual diversity in, the, um, in academia, in the medical profession, can be applied on a, a broader, sort of more international scale? The reason I ask is that in my own research a few years ago, I came across what seems like a very similar situation in Thailand, so that which you observed in Indonesia, um, specifically a very rich heritage in terms of ideas on sexual diversity, a more accommodating heritage, and by contrast, a, a contemporary problem of hostility, a lot of which comes from the modern psychiatric sector, which, as you observed in Indonesia, seems to have imported a lot of these um, pathologizing ideas and narratives from U Europe, um, from Euro the European um, sectors. So I wanted to ask you, I mean, how far do you think this, what you observed in Indonesia is a more global problem? Um, to what extent do you think your conclusions could be applied uh, more widely? Just any comments on that? Thank you very much. Yeah. Answer directly. Please, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I would just make comments on a personal basis. I haven't done research on it um, at an international level. Um, my thinking is that um, this type of uh, pathologizing through psychiatry um, is also happening in other kind of uh, sciences or disciplines like uh, medicine, uh, which have a more narrow view of sexuality uh, than, say, the social science. Uh, so, social science, the views on sexuality are more based on a combination of socialization together with biology. Um, but in, in Indonesia, perhaps in other places as well, um, psych psychiatry or psychology has um, developed a discourse on sexuality which really looks at a narrow view that it's based on biology. However, the science is, is uh, influenced by religious ideas and moral ideas which are socialized, so it's, uh, it's missing that other view. Um, I think that Thai situation is very different to Indonesia. I mean, um, yeah, tomboy culture is there, um, and many other kind of um, non -norm normative sexualities are present and accepted as part of the society. Where, and in Indonesia, that's um, no longer the case, or maybe was never the case. Um, so uh, I think that I would find different uh, answers on different kind of academic discourses. Thanks, Tamara, and uh, thank you for the question too. Would any of the rest of you like to address that question from your own geographical perspectives or elements of it? If not, don't, you don't have to. Um, though I am struck, uh, and I was struck in your paper, Tamara, by this idea that, uh, well, you can choose your scientific facts these days, as we know, in the age of Trump. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this idea that the, the fourth and fifth editions of the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual, were being rejected because the science was no longer science, or it was, it was science that had been lobbied for. I thought that was a really interesting point, and I wonder if we can think of kind of parallels to that in other contexts as well, but perhaps that's a, not necessarily where we need to go. Other questions? Who yeah, has, uh, okay, so, what, one, two, three, in that order? Did I miss any over the side of the room? Just one, no, okay, fine. Hi. Hi, I'm Lindy Fischer in Oxford. Can I ask the second speaker to kind of use three minutes to, you know, continue your fantastic talk? And that's basically it. I think you could uh, certainly address some of the, the, the people sent me their papers beforehand, and there were maybe eight papers, and then there was 55 papers, but uh, 55 pages. And um, I mean, maybe you could. Maybe the question is along the lines of what are the other. 
Um, <laughs> what are the other processes that you're, no, I mean, don't, let's, let's not switch it over, but if you could sort of, yeah, maybe uh, give us a brief tour of the other, wasn't it two other uh, okay. processes, so, dynamics you wanted to talk about? I will try my best to finish my, like the, the, uh, the last two parts. Uh, because I want to tell the story about the, the Asian cross, because I think that's a good place to, to think about that in this conference. Uh, think about the geographic location of um, the four countries that the Taiwanese Christian conservatives usually borrow the ideologies, discourses, and the repertoires from. Now, they include South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So they happen to be the, the past Asian tigers, so-called, because the economic growth and development you know, from the 1960s to the 1990s. So based on the similarities of uh, policy um, and politics and economy. Now, uh, I found that you know, based on the symbolic meanings of cross in my own Christian communities, no, the vertical, the horizontal access means the relationship between fellowship. Fellowship is the relationship between like the, the believers. Then the relationship between Hong Kong and Taiwan happen to the, the, the horizontal access. It's the way that how Taiwanese conservatives learn from the anti-gay discourses from Hong Kong. I can give you much more details about how the, the Hong Kong professors and the three so-called Trinity anti-gay network has been helped the Taiwanese conservatives to, to launch their own anti-gay campaign. And the vertical access is the combination of South Korea and Singapore. They, uh, Taiwanese conservatives learn from those two countries how to build mega churches, you know, by definition, a, a church which is larger than 2,000. Then the Asian cross is the new type of Asian tiger. And that also shows the complex of religion, politics, and economy. And usually that kind of politics has been ignored in the uh, heteronormative study of uh, political economy. And that's the Asian cross part. And the last part is you now Taiwan has become another producer of the anti-gay discourses based on the Mandarin, uh, Mandarin and the Chinese or the Sinophone um, speaking world, like the post-gay or the same-sex uh, intimate friendship stage. Those are the false facts about homosexuality. <coughs> like the post-gay in the queer study world, you now we think about how can we transcend or go beyond the politics, the identity politics of gay. However, there's a very few queer scholars that you know, use that term in Mandarin. So those ex-gay who were have, having the, the homosexual lives think you know, they don't want to be backward or less progressive. So they think they are post-gay because they transcend based on their own spirituality and religion. And that kind of reclaim the queer term in the conservative way makes Taiwan become another uh, producer of anti-gay discourses that I think transnational queer scholars should be more critical and radical against the discourses of Taiwan exceptionalism. Thank you. Thank you. I... <laughs> <laughs> so I think, Jack, you were just, yeah, sorry. Yeah, my, uh, Li Mai is uh, based in Beijing, travel here for this Queer Asia conference. And my question is also about the second speaker. Yeah, and there's some backlash in, in Taiwan I saw, it's about sexual education. And I know the Meng Meng, the anti-gay alliance, uh, they have a very cute name, Meng Meng. Uh, so, um, I was just wondering about their internal structure. Um, I know there's a, a huge generation gap between the two alliance, uh, the legalized gay marriage alliance and the uh, anti-gay alliance. So I was wondering, those people who are uh, in this conservative alliance, uh, is there a lot of young people, they dominate it, or most of them, they are Older people, uh, the patriarchs, uh, dominated this alliance. That, that's a very good question. I, I think that is a good question to open up you know, more discussion with my panelists. Especially, I want to hear more story about uh, South Korea and Indonesia and in, in India as well. Because, well, your question is right at the point of my next chapter. <laughs> uh, 
about the structure or the mobilization organization of the Christian conservatives. Um, the Presbyterian, um, Evangelical, and Charismatic churches are the core of uh, Christian conservative uh, campaigns in Taiwan. And, but the Presbyterian is a controversial case because that is also it is the largest you know, Christian denom denominations in Taiwan and has a very long history, 150 years right now. And that is also the church that has the most uh, people who support uh, gay or LGBT or Tongzi rights movement as well. But part of them try to use homosexuality as the leverage to gain their own political power within and without the church. At the same time, they appropriate the, uh, the Christian confusion and the heteronormative ideologies to expand their own alliance or coalition because they do collide with each other, um, with other uh, non-Christian followers. So now they try to use more ideology like tradition, unnatural, um, heteronormative family is that the only family that we should adapt. And now you say, you no, know, they too, uh, they hit at the soft spot of Taiwanese economy because it compared with the, the rising star of China and Vietnam, Taiwanese economy is not that stable. It's in a very precarious uh, condition. They think, you no, know, we should ignore the homosexual issue. We should focus on economy. But I think that is a now, how the conservatives expand and uh, establish their own coalition. But I'm not sure if that is also the case for other panelists, you know, based on your own story, you know, um, in terms of the organization of conservative communities. If anyone wants to answer. If you'd like <laughs> to speak right. to that, please do. Any first? Uh, OK, let me ask that uh, in South Korea, uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, conservatism is not about a generation problem because uh, young men are highly conservative, uh, turning to conservative ones uh, in this time because about the economic or political that uh, hardness, I guess. And as you said, church is uh, one of the most very uh, core of the conservation. So, you know, uh, just a month ago, a soldier who had a sexual intercourse with fellow soldiers, both were men, and they were convicted, uh, they were sentenced as guilty of uh, sexual perversion because the military law again, uh, forbidden that kind of sexual relationship between uh, males. So it is not illegal in the most, uh, how can I say, gen general law, but military law forbids it. So it's uh, kind of, I can't, I think that shows a uh, distinctiveness of South Korea, which is uh, still uh, have North Korea in our heads. So, yes, uh, in South Korea, I guess uh, that is the sketch. Okay. Yeah, um, I guess, yeah, I think, I don't think there's like a um, direct correlation between like age and conservatism um, for sure and also I think it's interesting to think about like um, this came up in the first panel today about like Hindutva which is like right-wing Hindu fundamentalism Islamophobia and like queerness and like where that all kind of fits in and I think it's easy to, I don't know, I'm just going to give an example and I don't know where I'm going with this, so you can stop me, but um, there's a documentary called The World Before Her, I don't know if any of you have seen it, um, and in that there is a young woman who participates or who is like a leader in a very right-wing Hindutva group um, camp. But what I find interesting about her is that, like, just taken as an individual, she seems to be finding, like, a queer space, a queer, like, imaginary within, like, this right-wing camp, right? So I think, I don't know where I'm going with that, but that's just to say that, like, I don't think the boundaries between, like, conservatism, queerness are, like, that 
distinct or like it's all like super complicated. <laughs> That's not helpful at all. But yeah. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments on Indonesia context. Um, from from what I know, uh, in that nationalism, the national movement had a big influence on the development of of social politics and having authoritarian state um, for around 30 years, uh, I think uh, has a big impact on uh, creating this heterosexual norm. Um, and Islam has taken a stronger role in the last decade or so, especially um, since 1998, which was um, when democracy happened, um, and 9-11 and shortly after that. Um, but nonetheless, without, without religion, it would still be a society in which really regulates individual behavior. Um, and I've been thinking about what the reasons for that are, and, and I think uh, it would be a mistake uh, to look just at the problem for LGBT community, but also what it's saying for other minorities, and that this is really um, a focus of the elites to um, target uh, and make them into a focus of um, lower class kind of uh, rebellion and, and not look at the bigger issues like massive corruption and, and growing inequality between classes. So um, just to yeah, keep that context in mind that economy and religion is very related. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, was there, there had been a question at the back, first of all, yeah, so we'll have to keep these quick. One, two, three, and that'll probably be all the time. Yes, right up the back. Uh, was there another one? No, I didn't. Okay, it's just... Um, my name is Pawan Lee. Uh, I'm now studying in Sussex University, and I have a question for Tamara. Tamara, yeah. Uh, regard, uh, because uh, in your conclusion, maybe you didn't have too much time, so you just mentioned that. Uh, the decolonization of the knowledge in psych psych psychology and psychiatry. Uh, so do you imply that the globalization in terms of ICD or the American Americanization in terms of DSM of psychological and medical knowledge per se is oppressive against sexual diversity? Also, in, because in some countries, not just, uh, Malay uh, not just Indonesia, I also heard some arguments in Malaysia that uh, Many psychiatrists or, or mental health experts, they consider the rejection of the revision of DSM is by itself anti-colonialism. Because, which is, they consider the new revision, as you just mentioned, is the political efforts by a newly emergence of LGBT activism in their local communities. So that's why they consider it's an anti-westernization version of the new of the fake science. So if so, uh, how do you how do you comment upon this kind of arguments? Because actually the officials from Malaysia like, did make some com uh, commentaries about this. And so what could be the alternative imaginary of the so-called scientific knowledge about psychology from your perspective? Thank you very much. Come on, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I would say that the Indonesian psychology handbook, it's not based on Indonesian knowledge and it's not an indigenous creation. It, it's based on a translation of a Western document. So their choice to not upgrade it and not uh, take on the new version um, is more strategic. And uh, I think that mm, in terms of how the DSM is oppressive. I was talking about um, previous versions of it, which did categorize uh, LGBT community as mentally disordered. And uh, that is then interpreted by academics and by practitioners how they like. But in the more uh, study of, which was through discussion and through interviews, uh, then the reality is very nuanced. Uh, many psychologists um, have a very open idea of, of hum humanity uh, being diverse and that uh, their role is to um, help individuals come to terms with their own 
sexuality and with how society treats them. Uh, so many gay people will come to psychologists for counselling and uh, some of those psychologists will um, then uh, refer them to other psychologists if they are concerned about their LGBT identity and some will work with them and counsel with them. So um, it's very mixed within the actual profession. But from the state discourse, I would say it's, it's homophobic. Thank you. Um, so we had one, and yes, there we go. I could have done it in that order, but just to give you some exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Alberto from Central European University. And my question has to do with, uh, we've been talking about pathologization and criminalization. And in my understanding, this happens already within this course. So uh, non-normative desire needs to be already in this course for it to be pathologized or criminalized. And I wonder how you navigate this in your research, particularly in the case of Taiwan and Indonesia, when I think you've said that in the past it was not criminalized or uh, like non-normative desire was more varied and allowed. And I wonder if you think that this not criminalization, it means that it was allowed or the tolerance, level of tolerance was higher, or if you think that being outside of this course at all is even worse if the goal is acceptance and tolerance. I just want to know how you deal with this in your own research. Thanks. Maybe a brief response from all of you to that might be quite fun. So we have four okay. questions. I need to think about this. So <laughs> like so. uh, actually, can I ask for more clarification? Can you shorten your question, like to be more specific? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so do you think that the fact that homosexuality or non-normative desire was never criminalized in, in Taiwan means that Taiwan had a high level of acceptance towards these kind of behaviors? Or do you think that the fact that it was not even criminalized means that it was not in the, it was not even allowed to be thought of it was completely outside of this course. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thanks. I got it. Thanks. Um, um, to answer your question, I want to tell you a very brief story about the uh, um, the past. What's going on here in the past century? Um, you know, before the invasion or intrusion of Christian colonizers in East Asia, including Japan, China, and Taiwan, um, many Homo erat eroticism has been allowed um, invisibly or underground, uh, especially around the, the male uh, elites. Uh, and that is the case in the era of pre-modern. So in that case, you know, the, the, the um, criminalization of um, the intolerance of homosexuality is the case only after um, the coming of Christian uh, especially Christian conservatives. So actually, you know, when people, especially many, many of the people that I study, consider homophobia is uh, conservative or is traditional, but I argue that they are quite modern. Actually, the homophobia is the creation and the invention of modernity, the westernization of modernity, and that insert into the DNA of the imagination of people. Uh, in Taiwan and their own imagination about what is the tradition. And they erase all of the traditional imaginary you know, into the textbook and also the ideology. That's my way to answer your question. Kyung Rim, would you like to say something about this as well? Because it seems quite uh, yes, pertinent I think it is context. similar in Korea to uh, the non-heterosexual uh, acts or relationships were invisible, just not on the focus of the discourse. It was not even I'm not saying it is worse to it was not worse to discuss about, but it was just not on the focus of the discourse because it doesn't matter whether it existed or people are doing it. It just simply didn't matter. I guess that's the uh, pretty much pre-modern uh, context of uh, Korea. No pressure, but if you have anything to say, you're welcome. Either of you. Um, yeah, I guess uh, to. To link it 
to translation, I just want to say that like um, the Western conception of translation, which is uh, inherently heteropatriarchal, I think, um, is closely linked with Western notions of modernity, with Western notions of the nation state, um, and um, did come, or like, uh, its perversiveness now is a result of colonization. Um, and I think, so that's one point, but at the same time, um, I'm very of also like fetishizing like something that is pre-modern uncomplicatedly. So. Okay, you don't have to if you don't want to tell me. Because um, we have one more question in about, well, minus one minute. Yeah, so. let's move on. Okay, final question. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, hello, I'm Yawan. I'm starting law here at SAS. Um, my question stands from um, Tamara's presentation. However, I invite every presenter to uh, fr you know, freely comment on my observation. Um, I'm wondering to what extent the whole society uh, really buys um, the medicalized discourse of homosexuality. I'm asking this because, at least from my point of view, I always feel there exists certain um, tension between the discourse of making homosexuality a some kind of illness uh, vis a vis um, criminalization. Um, criminalization of uh, homosexuality um, because it, it seems to me, well, if, if it really buys the discourse of, of um, um, sickness, you might think that it's not really a good way to treat patients, right, to throw them um, into presence or to, to lash them publicly. So if we really believe that's true, it is, it is kind of disease, then you might try to think about a way to treat them, and yet the whole society um, choose and pick a Western discourses regarding homosexuality and you know, treat them freely um, you know, as they wish. And so it seems to me, at least, there is some kind of half-heartedly belief on, on the uh, taking uh, or absorbing the scientific, uh, fake scientific um, discourse just in order to uh, express their disgust on, on this behavior. So um, I don't know, of, of course I won't um, encourage people to uh, pursue that route in order to de decriminalize uh, homosexuality in, in some societies. However, um, I'm wondering whether that's actually a signal that people don't really believe in this discourse. Hmm. Thank you for the question. I think uh, that's a really interesting uh, way to frame it. Um, looking at, at homosexuality as an illness, I think helps uh, to then allow opponents to talk about illness spreading, like as though uh, it's contagious. Um, so the police needs to intervene uh, to stop uh, LGBT from meeting in public or having sexual relationships uh, because doing so is dangerous for themselves but, but also for society. So there's a lot of um, blogs posted. Um, one of the psychiatrists that was on the uh, Indonesian Lawyers Club has written a blog. Her name's Ellie Rizman and it's like eight signs uh, or eight ways to stop your child becoming gay. And then it talks about um, uh, make sure that uh, you don't let them use smartphones and make sure they're not <laughs> eating too much junk food and like really <laughs> ridiculous things. Um, but I think, yeah, you're right in saying that illness doesn't really stand up if we're going to look at criminalizing things. But uh, there's a long history of um, saying that, you know, women who think radically are. Uh, mentally ill, we need to lock them up. So it's a way of um, of uh, oppression and a way of reducing their um, rights in society. 
Uh, I think, um, although you did invite everyone to speak or to address it, I think we should probably wrap it up there, um, since we're already a little over time. Thank you all. Uh, I think words matter, um, and I think we've seen that in you know, words, concepts, how they travel, and how, I mean, that there's really been a very, a, a set of great papers. Thank you all for your oops, discussions. Um, in 10 minutes' time, uh, we have in this room, Laws in Indonesia, Activism and LGBT Rights, which is uh, Yasmin Purba in conversation with Ben Murta, and then over in the KLT, a performance lecture by Lou Zihan. But in the meantime, can I ask you just to join me in thanking the speakers and enjoy the rest of the time.